<laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't complain. No, you didn't. I know. <laughs> I saw your face. <laughs> and we're live on YouTube. Yeah. I just, I just was relieved when it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Mim. But for those who are on YouTube, we were just playing uh, some Daft Punk around the world. But for monetization purposes, we're not going to play it now. <laughs> yes. Mim, so, do you want us? Uh, can you remind us about GDPR? Oh yes. Can you go to the next slide, please? Yes. Thank you so much. Right. Just to let everybody know, uh, we're currently recording live on YouTube. Uh, you can see the sign on the Zoom. Right there somewhere that red sign um and all, we're also going to be screenshotting and sharing some love on social media like instagram facebook twitter linkedin all of that and we're also going to be sharing all of this on our website and you'll feel free to share this on your social media as well so basically all recorded and uh, if you don't want your faces on here that's also fine please turn your camera off and your microphone off uh, but otherwise we'd love to see your faces so please show your faces if you if you are comfortable thank you and uh, so those who have just joined us welcome to the Wednesday web jam and for newcomers welcome for the first time for the uh, uh, old comers no <laughs> regulars non-regulars <laughs> sorry for, for regulars non-regulars uh, Welcome back. Uh, this is the Wednesday Web Jam. It is a space for us to prototype, learn, connect, and fail forward together. And that is our motto, failing forward. So today we have uh, three special guests. We have Zahara Shetty, Federico Granda, and Daryl Lim. And a round of applause, everybody. You can yeah. unmute and... Thank you. And uh, yes, so Yunyan, can you kindly spotlight Zahara, Federico, and Daryl, please? <laughs> oh, I'm. Sorry, technical difficulties. <laughs> um, yes, so everybody, I'd like to introduce you to Zahara Shetty. Uh, this, uh, she's based in uh, Pretoria, South Africa. She's a conscious design coach, trauma and technology futurist, founder of African Futures Academy, and her day job is recently at Accenture. Uh, round of applause. And. We will also, we also have Federico in the house. So Federico Granda, he's based in Bogota, Colombia. He's a serial entrepreneur, innovation and business consultant, and he's also a teacher. Sometimes he teaches at universities. And he's also a representative of Design Thinkers Group uh, for Colombia and Mexico. He's also a former marketing director at Securities Exchange Colombia. And we also have Daryl Lim in the house. Woo! Uh, Daryl is based in Singapore. He's co-founder and managing partner of Design Thinkers Academy Singapore. He's an experienced co-creator, storyteller, and he is also a global citizen. Yes, so welcome our guests. Woo! Round of applause, everybody. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're very happy to have our guests here and so happy to see many of our regulars. And if you're new to the Wednesday Web Jam, Welcome to, to this community. Uh, we've been wanting to have this, this conversation for a long time because our community is very international and we've been curious about uh, culture and how design thinking looks like and, and works like and how it's done in different societies. So that's why we have uh, gathered this trio of guests as a part one and we hope to have many more conversations uh, in the future of this type but we thought this is a very fine group of people uh, to have our first rounds of conversations. So, <clears throat> so with that, I'm just gonna jump into the first question. By the way, uh, for the, the uh, audience, mem audience members, we're gonna be asking questions from our audience, but we're also gonna drop some of those questions as prompts in the chat where you can share your own experiences. Um, and of course, at the bottom, 
of the hour, we will go, we will formally wrap up our program and then move into backstage, which is not live, live cast uh, into YouTube. It's just for the people in the room. And then you'll have more space to share and, and have interactions with our panelists. That said, uh, let's get started. So Sahara, I'd like to direct this question at you first, and then we can, time permitting, we can hear a few brushstrokes as well from our other two guests. But um, so, so if you can tell us brief, briefly what cultural influences have shaped and formed you as a person, and we just acknowledge that we may have grown up or lived in different places around the world. Um, so what cultural in influences have shaped you as a person, both professionally and or personal? Tell us about that. So I think the, the biggest thing for me was, you know, growing up in South Africa, it was pretty interesting, uh, especially during apartheid, you know, where uh, there, there wasn't such a thing as South African culture because we all grew up in, in different groups and we didn't really have contact with other people. So, um, you know, there were different cultures, different communities, and they, they each were developing separately. And I think um, the one thing that we had in common was that, you know, people were defined by their communities. People were made by who they were surrounded by, right? So that's a pretty African and I think Eastern view. We call it Ubuntu, that you are who you are because of other people. So I think that really, you know, influenced me. And I was really curious about how everybody else lived and what the other cultures were like and what, you know, the things I didn't know about. And for that thing, the first time we got to know that was when we went to university or we started work and then you started seeing other kinds of people. <clears throat> So I think I was just always fascinated by people. And that's what led me to study psychology and anthropology. It was just, you know, I wanted to know what was going on with other cultures and, and everything. You know, it was so fascinating to me. So I think people is, is my passion, <laughs> just getting to, to know what they're like and how uh, everything affects them. And also, I think when I was working in the Middle East, I, I was doing some research and I read this article um, by Abdel Majid Najjar, and they were talking about the different levels of influence we have uh, as humans, you know, our duty to preserve human life, the human self, society, and the environment. So I think that influenced my ideas of how the world works and the, con the consequences of our actions. So, you know, uh, UX design didn't really cut it for me anymore. It was more like you know, there were bigger problems to solve. So everything needed to be redesigned because we needed to be more purposeful and, and kind of look at where we were going and in the future. So that's how I got into futures thinking as well. Yes, yeah, so I think there's a lot of different things. Thank you. So let's go around the horn. Daryl, I know that you're in Singapore, but you also have roots from elsewhere. So tell us about uh, what cultural inferences shaped you as a person, both professionally and personally. Thank you, Easy. Well, uh, well, I, I I grew up in a very um, a very strict family in a certain sense. So so I I'm brought up in a Catholic culture. My my mom and my dad were always very strict about certain things that we do, uh, what we do after school, and and what do we do before we eat. We say our graces and things like that. Um, so so it's always been very prim and pot, proper, right? Uh, and I, as I as I grew up. Uh, I, I took on the courses that they always told me to, right? So you go take on take on something that you will always find a job in. And so I took on engineering. Uh, I, I did my business degree and, and and I ended up doing everything else rather than what I had learned. Uh, and I realized something for myself uh, uh, that, that in Singapore, a lot of us are pretty well programmed. Uh, we, we, have, we have very good support uh, from 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 the education system, from the political system, uh, very good support even up to our death, right? Where we are given funds to continue this whole aspect of lifelong learning. But the question here is, what are our choices made of? And I think how I was influenced is really when I, when I went over to Netherlands and I realized that I had missed out on a lot of things and I had been making decisions because I was programmed to make decisions in this way. And I realized that uh, life can be a lot more fulfilling. Life can be a lot more meaningful if we really spend a bit more time pausing and giving ourselves that due diligence to complete each trial uh, 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 as they come to us. And since then, 
uh, 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 I think that's that's how my life has changed in Singapore. Today, I make it a, a point that even if I'm faced with a difficulty, I need to make sure that I give it enough time to really sit down and consider to myself how how should I grow from this and, and what is really the reason why I'm facing this situation and, and what is the emotion I'm facing. I think that has helped me to grow uh, uh, and also helped me to make better decisions. Uh, uh, and now, of course, uh, we're trying to bring this out to the rest of the people in Singapore as well, really pausing and asking ourselves, what is your role? Or are you simply yet another human being that does not have a meaning all the way to your deathbed, I guess? Yeah, and I think your background kind of gives it away a little bit, your, your Zoom oh, no. background that you, you, you're a pretty joyful dude. Like, it's really fun to hang out with you. So you always, always try to bring joy and, and laughter to people. That's, that's something I, I've known about you when, when we get to hang out in, in conferences and things. Yes, easy. <laughs> awesome. So Federico, let's let's pass the ball over to you. Uh, what influences have shaped and formed you as a person, personally and professionally? Well, that's that's also fun because to every Colombian, people say that you don't look Colombian because Colombia is a melting pot cultural. Hmm. So there's not like a single Colombian. We are very different from each other, and this is why we are such a fragmented country. Many of our issues are based on that. But that's also fun. I mean, uh, as a Colombian, I'm also a melting pot of cultures. Uh, I, I'm made in China. <laughs> so you see that I, uh, my mom got pregnant from me in China I mean, because my father used to work there for the Chinese. And my mother was Colombian, but she was educated by Germans. So then you start putting more ingredients. Then I was educated in school by Italians, but they couldn't handle me. So I got spelled and they took me with the Spaniards that they were, you know, different. Yeah, I'm made in China. <laughs> when it says that, yeah. And then I was educated but by Spaniards. Then that was very interesting and by Americans as well and Japanese in the US. So that's, I started to have like a lot of influences and, and I don't know. And Maybe the most important during the last 10 years, 12 years has been the influence, the cultural influence by Israelis, because I'm also a Kabbalah mentor and student. And, and according to the things that you were saying that, that you were start like thinking about people and uh, putting people in first place, I think that was like the place where I found a match, like cultural match in the way of working, the way of thinking with Israelis, because they taught me some things very important, like, you know, putting first people before you. That's not Colombian. In Colombian, we always you put you first, and then the others. So starting to think first about the others before you um, changed my life, because I know that sounds weird, but it's not the way we roll here in Colombia. And that started to change my life and it has everything to do with design thinking in the end, you know, because that's my passion. I mean, Kabbalah is my passion. I'm a full-time student. But when you speak about design thinking, you're always speaking about empathy all the time and thinking about needs of the others, human-centered stuff. So then I found both worlds, my spiritual world and my professional world. And, and that was nice. That was a nice influence to became like a different kind of uh, business and innovation consultant, like driven to that. So that was like a short summary. It's like a lot of influences. And actually my parents, they are from two different regions that they don't like to eat with each other, like Madrid and Barcelona, for example, <laughs> or Los Angeles and New York. That's kind of the, <laughs> the, the, the regions from my mother and my father, the two rivals. So yeah, that's, that's the melting pot that I am. And and so we, we actually very intentionally curated this, this group of panelists because there's a shortcut of like, oh, where are you from? Oh, this place. Oh, so you're like, you're like this, but we all have, uh, well, not all of us, but, but many of us just have very different influences and experiences and places where we live. Um, so it's, it's, it's just great to like work around the shortcut and really dig in and, and get, to know, get to know people. Um, Sahara and, and then Daryl, do you want to give uh, a little more color as to like what made you get into the into design thinking? 
Um, I, I don't think it was intentional for me. There was obviously no such thing as design thinking when I finished school <laughs> and wanted to study. So, you know, again, with the Indian culture, it's like, you know, you've got to either be a doctor or an engineer so I studied uh, computer science because I didn't want to study medicine <laughs> so yeah so that me so I studied computer so here's the thing right I was interested in lots of different things I couldn't figure out what I wanted to study so my parents were like you know go and do the computer science thing because you get a good job right so I did that but I really wanted to do fashion design and visual design and study psychology and anthropology so I you know I said let's let me study everything. So I did that, you know, so I studied some things part time, some full time. And I ended up uh, teaching programming. And then I got into software design. And from there, it was like, you know, I just kind of <laughs> invented my way through uh, the team, you know, just looking at what I was learning in all these other fields in psychology and anthropology in design, and just kind of putting it together, you know, uh, because even when I was in school, you know, we did this course, I think when I was 10 years old, we were put in this program where we studied creative problem solving. So I think that really, really kind of put everything together for me, because this was like, okay, yeah, now I know how to bring everything together. And I, yeah, I think I just kind of made it my own. Um, yeah, so I guess when I was in software, there was no such thing as UX or visual design or, or design thinking at the time, you just kind of I remember making this PowerPoint for my manager and I was like, you know, I want to have this, uh, this job where uh, <laughs> I could use all the stuff that I studied. And he looked at me and he said, you're nuts. It's not going to happen. And I just said, no, I'm going to do it. And then I started researching and I found a lot of examples online of, of people who are using this. And for me, design thinking was just uh, design thinking was just another creative problem solving method, you know, of getting stuff done and figuring out things. Uh, for people. Yeah. Daryl, how, how about you? <clears throat> hey, thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, I just I just put up a little picture of, of, of my end goal today. Um, but well, uh, so I've been in the education line for the past 15 years. So I, I've, 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 I've done all the certifications in Singapore and I'm an adult educator, uh, uh, training uh, skill sets, yeah, to, to individuals. As, as I journeyed on this whole 15 years, I had developed um, standards, I had developed uh, organizations uh, based on competencies and things like that. Something of, of a buzzword to those of you who are educators in here. But I asked myself, what does it really mean to be a lifelong learner? And I think that's something that really struck me. And I think being a design thinker really helps me to become a lifelong learner because every single life opportunity is an opportunity to learn and it's when we discover that that we don't have to go to school anymore <laughs> I, I actually took on a, my master's last two years ago and i left i realized that hey i'll probably be uh, happier learning from f learning from people and experts like yourself learning from my own failures learning from people's failures and 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 taking each lesson as my own uh, uh, a realization of a deeper meaning and 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 so of course this picture came to my mind uh where you know life life could start off with a mess we have been taught that you know just try and make the whole mess a straight line so that life is going to be simple and clear but if you embrace that mess we would realize that we end up with several new choices of uh you know whether i can't see that actually I'm, I'm, I'm using a small screen hold on let me just switch that back to speaker mode yeah so <laughs> you could either collaborate you could restore relationships that are broken, you could empower people, or you could continue to engage. And I think that has given me a whole new world of opportunities to help and opportunities to grow. And that, to me, is really the essence of design thinking. Uh, I've been blessed as well to have people coming to me having conversations, and really these conversations I have with people is really very uh, self, it's very enriching especially when it is something to do with my own blind spots. These are the best conversations because uh, uh, it's people who care that gives you these conversations. People who don't care, they will just go away, right? Because they didn't like that. So I think these are all opportunities that I embrace today. And um, design thinking allows us that first diamond to explore what is going to be the new me. Thank you.
So just really quick before we go to the second round of questions, we just had a, a quick follow up. If you could just like make a bullet list, like a lightning round, we'll start with you, Sahara. Um, <clears throat> what what countries have you practiced like design thinking in, be it in person or virtually? Now that we're working virtual a lot. Uh, so I've worked in South Africa, in uh, Kenya. Uh, Algeria, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Wow. Okay. So that's that's big geography. Uh, Daryl, let's go to you. Like, how many societies have you? Society. <laughs> countries do, do you one, interact with? One mother earth. No, mother well. Earth. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, uh, d different different countries. That uh, I I would probably just say the one that I enjoyed the most. Um, uh, I would say in Myanmar. Uh, being in Myanmar, recognizing uh, the different. We had six different countries over there, uh, from Vietnam, Thailand, Myanmar, uh, 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 China, and um, Laos, and I can't remember who's the other one. Um, well, the the exchange of cultures and the co-creation potentials were marvelous. The conversations that took place really made me see that, hey, we might be we might be coming from different grounds, but that's exactly where we can grow into because I don't see things through the other person's eyes, and that was the most beautiful time I had in twenties twenty nineteen I think. Nice, Federico. Let's popcorn over to you. Like, what what countries have you worked with? Okay, I can say America, and I don't mean America, like the country, I mean the continent, <laughs> from yeah. the US to Patagonia. Like, uh, I've worked with people from all over, and uh, it's cool because there's when you can tell how different we also are between Latin Americans. Um, I've also worked a lot with Germans, and I love working with Germans. I don't know if that's my mother's bias that I was telling to you, but I really like the uh, process with Germans because... Yeah, I mean, they're very clear in their things. They are very respectful with timings and with Spaniards as well with Spain. I think that will be like America, the entire Spain, Germany. And through the Germans, I met people from, you know, many countries because of the project that we made that was for, for many, many, many places. Cool. So, so you've interacted with people from different societies. So you always, that always requires some adaptation, right? And, and some accommodation of different points of views, et cetera. Okay, yep. so let's go to our official round two of questions. Um, so let's let's start this this round with with you, Federico. So how what's your interpretation? Like, how has design thinking been received in this you know in the societies and places where 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 you work? And you know, can you illustrate your your answers with some examples? Well, I can. I, I want to speak about Colombia because uh, it's weird because people don't know design thinking in Colombia as much as we think. So. You know, it's mean, it's, we have many years of design thinking, history, decades, but people don't know design thinking. So um, to, that, that has two sides. The first one is that because it's new for them, they are interested, but they don't understand it. And, and I have the other side is that uh, I, I ask them to tell you that I used to be the, the uh, that I'm the former uh, marketing director from the Securities Exchange, because when people call me, they have this bias with numbers and finance and, you know. So many times when we start a process with design thinking with the local clients, um, they, they want to know about finance and numbers before they know their customers. They start making research, they start understanding people, they start to, to center the, the design for people. So, that's kind of the way do you live it. So I, I started to make some, to blend, you know, some financial consulting with uh, all the stages because they start like, I want to know how much my product ha may cost, how much money I'm going to make, how much it's going to cost all the time. And it's also very normal here because this country is full with SMEs, with the small and medium enterprises. And uh, we are always in economical crisis. So people are always thinking about that because they have no time for other thinking about the other stuff. So that's kind of a, the thing. So I started to, to blend, you know, to mix like, okay. So uh, when we are in empathy and, and defining the problems and in every single part, I try to give some, some, some financial hints because they start to get really stressed because they want to know about money and um, time here. I mean, long processes, people feel them really long and they start to suffer a lot. 
So that's a little bit like how you live sometimes design thinking here. People start to, know, you know, they want to know the end. And I know it happens in many countries, but here it happens the most because we're always in crisis. So that's that's like, uh, I, I like to tell like, how do you live it in Colombia? And, and yeah, that's a good well, part. I, I think there's some universals to what you shared, but then there's also some particulars. We'll, we'll come back and dig yeah. into some partic particulars in a little bit. Sahara, so let's let's hear from you how how has the same thinking been received in you know by the people places where you've worked? I think it, it took a lot of time for them to get used to the idea, and I think <laughs> my superpower is like making people <laughs> uncomfortable. <laughs> like my motto is life in life is I came, I saw, and I made it awkward. Right? I'm, I'm always in the space a lot where I'm trying to introduce new ways of new ways of doing things and asking them awkward questions, and everybody's like. Like, you know, I ruffle a lot of feathers, feathers and I'm, I'm in trouble a lot, right? And people don't like that, especially in a corporate. You know, they like their rules, their hierarchies and the way they do things. So, yeah, you know, and you come like, you know, but you're not listening. This is not how we do things. So I found, you know, where I'm really comfortable is in an innovation part or where, you know, they want to try something new, but they don't know how to do it and they don't know what the next steps are. So then they're willing to trust you. They're just like, okay, do what you need to do, you know, and that's the best part. Um, so a small team where you have some trust and, and you have the leeway to do what you need to do. Uh, and I've usually found, you know, I've, my experience was initially just starting like a UX team in a software company. And then when I went into Pearson education, it was them trying to move from publishing to digital. So they didn't really know, you know, how to do that. So they introduced this innovation part to figure that out. And then when Absa Barclays, you know, started the Africa design office, I was one of the first people to join the team. But then when things normalized, I, I left because you know once the you know they know what they're doing i don't think people really need me anymore so i'm more there when they don't know what what the next steps are or it's too ambiguous to figure out um so then i started my own consulting and um i think i went into the the development space because i think that's where they really really had big problems to solve and then you know it was very complex very a lot of different stakeholders and they needed design thinking to kind of help them figure stuff out. It was no no longer about products for me, you know. So I went in that direction and I love working in that space. It's it's a mess. <laughs> yeah. In in the different geographies that, that you've worked in, was there uh, a place, and, and I know that's just a shortcut, right? Because there's individual people and organizations. There's a lot of layers to that. <clears throat> was was there uh, one of the geographies where you've worked where you found it, you found it team or the people a little more receptive to, to that human-centric approach? Uh, yeah, so I think in the eastern side of the world, or, or let's say from Africa eastwards, people are more community-centric, so they care about other people and what they think, uh, you know, so they really, really want to know how they can do what's best for their people, so that helps a lot, you know. But on the other side, I found a lot, it's more about business and numbers and ROI and how many users you can get to click. And that just, yeah, right. that's yeah. very so that, that, that piece sounds, has a little bit of resonance with what also uh, Federico mm -hmm. was sharing. Daryl, let's popcorn over to you. Um, so how, how do you, what's your reading of how design thinking is received by people from different places that, that you interact with? To be frank, uh, when I when I started off with design thinking, it was it was really like a a passe in that sense. Design thinking has been some in Singapore for some time, but it's it's always been overlooked. Uh, uh, and and I think it reached a certain point where our prime minister decided to just use the word design thinking, and everyone started their, their, their you know started to look at what design thinking is about. Uh, but I think the true meaning of design thinking didn't quite come until COVID came. And I think that was one of the best, or maybe the worst for any other countries, sorry to say that, but <laughs> to me, I think it's the best pivot of humankind because that is the time where uh, a lot of us realize that we need to kind of just pause and rethink our purposes and reframe and a lot of organizations in Singapore uh, also said things like, oh, we are relaying our tracks, we are re rethinking our, our business strategy. And I think that, that was the most beautiful part. 
and everyone embrace the notion of you don't know what you don't know. So let's go and do it together. So I think for us in particular in Singapore, uh, when, when we had our lockdown, uh, the best thing that happened to me was a group of friends that came together and, and a lot of them are in this room right now uh, 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 where we started a little conversation called Simple Pleasures. All we wanted to do was to be human and to provide that space. And that space happened every week, twice a week. Uh, and that helped us all to pivot, to recognize our personal values, our personal missions. Some of us became business partners, some of us became uh, associates with each other. We found new directions uh, uh, and some of us are already very successful today. Uh, and simply really, um, it has created new friendships and, and that was something beautiful. You're on mute. <laughs> Can't get through a meeting without being on mute. So you, just, you were just sharing something that I wanted to, to dig into just a little bit more. Uh, uh, you mentioned something around companies uh, or some organizations in Singapore kind of re, relaying their tracks or, or something to that effect. Do, do, uh, has there been a couple of examples of that that you found particularly striking? Is that relaying their direction with a more human-centric approach or, or what kind of change is it that they're making? For sure. In fact, in fact, right till today, we are working with a construction company, right? You know that uh, one of the most vulnerable people are the foreign workers that are working in our construction industry. And, and a lot of them are, are stuck uh, working, in, working in their sites and living in the dorms. And, and I would say it's not that the dorm conditions are bad. The dorm conditions are actually pretty fine. But because of the space that they have, right? So they are a lot more vulnerable. But this organization that we work with have spent quite a bit of time telling us and asking us, can you just help us to understand the journeys that they are going through as well? Because we really want to create something meaningful for them while they, you know, while, while they take the risk of working with us. And that was something really beautiful. Uh, so, so one of the biggest discoveries, I don't know whether I've got time, but I just want to share this. One of the biggest discoveries of this was, 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 was that was some little facts that little touch points that I cannot buy the food that is within my dorm because I do not have an ATM machine to draw from and it wasn't about being isolated in the dorm it wasn't about their uh, communications with their family it was little little insights like that that the company started to really embrace this whole human centricity and now they have launched a lot of different campaigns to engage and you know, you know offer prizes we do a little uh, fun contest and you know sending pictures to each other that's really beautiful oh, that's awesome. uh, thank you for sharing that um, i'm happy i asked about it because that was, that was a really cool example so Federico, now turning back to you because this 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 whole event, folks, was was sort of uh, we 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 wanting to do something like this, but it was kind of triggered by a conversation that I had with Federico. So, uh, question for you, Federico, is you know, are there any adaptations uh, around design thinking type of tools or frameworks that you've had to make to connect with your audiences? And I'll I'll just ask a leading question here. I know we had a conversation about your adaptations of the uh, business model canvas. So if we might want to open with that, you can add some other examples if, if you will. But what, tell us about the deploying business model canvas in, in Colombia and what you've done with it. Okay, so yeah, I can answer that. And I want to answer Horia. Horia, I don't know if I, I spell it well because she made an interesting question that also related with that yes. concerning the Thank securities you. exchange. Yeah. So first I'm going to answer you, Essay. And uh, yeah, the conversation was that that business model canvas is Swiss. It was made by a Swiss guy, Alexander Osterwalder, and it's perfect, <laughs> everything, and it's very methodic, methodic, you know? But when you, every time you finish a business model canvas in Colombia, or in, in, in a Latin country, not only Latin America, I mean, France is a Latin country, for example. When you start to put that in practice, our realities are very different from that, are very abstract. Uh, that's the word that, that I will use. I mean, they are complex because they are abstract. So you will have a lot of competitors. People will be changing their mind all the time. You don't have that trust that you can find between investors 
and the company that is raising the capital, for example. So they want to know every single detail. So when you sp speak about key activities, you don't want to know, do you, in, in a country like ours, like a Latin country, you don't only want to know the key ones. You want to know everything because you don't trust. And that's normal. I mean, and you don't trust that just because things happen, you know? So, so what I started to do was like, uh, I took, uh, the business model canvas, like a stutter, you know, like the, the, the main uh, methodology, because it's very important for people to understand if people don't want your product, if they don't need it, etc. you won't sell anything. So that's for me, the most important part of that. And then I blended with a French methodology that these guys from HEC, the, this uh, business school in, in Paris made, that his name is Odyssey 3.14. And you can find that one. It's open in Coursera. It's, and it's a very cool methodology because they said, okay, let's make things French. Okay, let's make things Latin. So let's think about other kind of value propositions for other lots of tens and 20, and, you know, dozens of segments because that's how business really rolled down here. And let's think about our competitors that, you know, Business Model Canvas never speaks about your competitors and you will have to fight against them. And let's think about some old school tools like a uh, value chain that has every single step. And I started to blend that. And, and they also said that even you can have a great value proposition, but if you're not profitable, you're not doing anything because no one's going to come here and help you. So that's when I blended again with uh, financial for non-financial uh, modeling that I have, that it's graphic designer proof. And I have a, a former student of mine, Paula Alvarez, she's writing there. So uh, my kid, yeah, she's around there. She's, <laughs> she has a new toy. I'm sorry <laughs> if you can listen to <laughs> if that. So, and I blended with this uh, financial for non-financial model and tried to, you know, to, we call it here like uh, tropicalize, you know, all this business modeling stuff. But it also worked for other realities. And when I say Latino realities, I mean Italians, French, Spaniards, Argentinians, Mexicans, everything, because we have more abstract and hard realities. No one's coming to help for us. And that's like the example that we were speaking with Essay. So, and it's, it's been working very well because in the end they say, oh yeah, we have competitors and yeah, we can sell the same thing to other five different segments and things are not as easy as you think they are, okay? And uh, there's also, the, for, for those who speak Spanish, um, look for pensamiento magico pendejo. If there's a Mexican, I'm sorry for the, for the word, but I'm going to write it down. But it's, it's about the magical thinking and pendejo. That's the, the word that you shouldn't use in Mexico. And it's all about it, that things won't get magically done. You know, So that's part of the things that I, I always try to do when we go to these prototyping stage, for example that we do. And I wanted to uh, answer really quick to Horia. Uh, she said, or he, that uh, if we made any design thinking project with the securities exchange, okay. Back in the days, uh, I was the marketing guy. And the only thing that I could do was only like um, research and empathy kind of a project because the thing with securities exchange is not that people is not human centered, is that you are expendable. I mean. I could be working like hard, I was a hard worker back in the days, I'm still, but I could do all my work well, the security exchange and something could happen in the market that will ruin everything. So nothing was up to me. And I could be like the worst employee and something could go right and things will go good for me and I'll have you know an extra bonus for, for, for December or whatever. So the thing with the securities exchange is that there's, you can do some stuff till one level. So you can try to understand the types of uh, investors that you have, those that are dreaming for a house, those like, like risk, et cetera. And when you have to deal with them, like, uh, you know, if you have a crisis, like the ones that we always have, like Lehman Brothers crisis kind of a, a crisis, then you know how to deal with them, you know, but you cannot do too much. And maybe sometimes traders also cannot do anything because they have rules, they have markets, they have things over them. So it's be, trying to be empathetic with the securities exchanges, knowing that you cannot do a lot of stuff. I mean, it's like, it's like that. But 
what happened with the security exchange in me was that uh, I got biased with that and that was good because people say, okay, if you, you had the ability to understand the entire markets because I was the guy that was supposed to explain people what was a derivative or a swap to anyone. They say, okay, this guy knows a lot about finance. And it's not, that, that isn't true, but it was good because people start calling me <laughs> because of that. So and that's it. That's, yeah. thank, thank you for that, Iko. Um, I want to popcorn over to Sahara. And, and I mean, we were very curious, uh, especially in Empanaya as, as we were uh, curating this this panel like you, you've worked about around many many geographies so uh just curious about what adaptations you've had to make to to this toolkit this human-centric toolkit as you've moved around either within your own you know home base or as you've moved around different geographies yeah i think for me you know design thinking is just a framework and it's, it's pretty elastic right according to the size of the problem you're solving so if it's a very downstream product related problem, you know, everything is there, it's laid out. But as the problem gets bigger, you've got to expand that framework. So I think in each phase, there's like hundreds of different methods you could use. And each time you have a problem, you need to, to understand the context and what you're dealing with and who you're dealing with. And just have to pick and choose and kind of reconstruct a strategy of how to use these design thinking tools and how to adapt them to that situation. So, I mean, there's no standard way for every project. For me, it's a different set of methods, uh, adapting those methods based on who you, you need to, to research and what you're trying to achieve, actually. Sometimes it's a product, sometimes it's something digital. Sometimes you just got to leave the community the way they are because that is the best thing for them, you know, depending on what the issue is. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very elastic space. I think it grows and and based on the size of the problem you're solving. Yeah, so for me, it's just a set of tools, creative problem solving tools that you need to pick and choose, I guess. Nice. Daryl, let's, let's hear from you. Well, well for me, for me um, I've adapted a bit of my tools on, on the empathy research itself. I spent a bit of I spend a bit more time because I think I've gone through this myself. Uh, so I've used the the Platchik, I don't know whether it's the right name, the Platchik Emotions Wheel. Uh, uh, have you heard of that? The, the the really big round emotions wheel, which has a really huge number of emotions. I think that that has really influenced me personally as well because as I asked myself and as I continued this research with uh, education institutions as well, I've asked how even at home, right, uh, with our families and and, and our children. Have we exposed our children to the other emotions, or at least, at least ten to twenty of the emotions within the wheel? Have we? The answer is usually no, because uh, we have always been brought up with that same happily ever after, happy, sad, disappointed, tired, so on and so forth. But when was the last time your child had felt some form of isolation? Your child had felt some form of, let's say. Um, can't think of one at this point but i think that has helped me to 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 connect with people because this starts to tell people that there is actually a lot of things that you don't know about yourself how ready are you to really start to create solutions for others if you don't know about yourself right if you cannot even define your own emotion how are you going to define an emotion for a customer right uh, if you want to create a certain type of emotion do you understand that emotion and i think that has really helped us uh, 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 to really relook at what design thinking is. It's not purely just discovery with nowhere to go and you know it's really very much about discovering that touch point with an emotion tag to it. I, that's a very powerful point, Daryl. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, I, I think self-exploration is, is so um, so powerful. I know uh, over the years on and off, I, I've done a yoga practice and I've noticed that that helped to tune my ability to notice. So it makes me better at the research part and like tuning into other people. So even that type of approach of like working things out for yourself. Yeah, that's very, very powerful. Thank you for sharing that. Um, all right, here, heading into round three as the clock ticks near the end of the hour. Uh, so 
very curious about hearing how has design thinking influenced you as a person, you know, and within your work. And and Daryl, maybe we'll throw the ball first to you since you started to unpack that right now with your last comment. Do you want to uh, <laughs> jump on that question and, and continue? Yeah, well, well, yes. So I make it a point today to 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 really point out what is that emotion for myself first and then help others to discover the emotions for themselves because a lot of times as soon as it is an unfamiliar situation we run we have been taught to run everything that we have learned we have been told manage your risk never fall into that difficult situation therefore you will never be disappointed and i think that is one of our biggest biggest mislearnings i would feel we have all been given opportunities and a heart to fully utilize and to recognize the different opportunities of learning with emotions we have not been using it enough and i feel that that is something like my own personal mission today let me understand myself so that in future i can help other people to rec and understand themselves and to create value for themselves and the people that they care for I'm on mute. I know it's like mining. Uh, let's pop going over to Sahara. Uh, how has design thinking influenced you as a as a person and and also within your work? Yeah, I think um, it it given it's given me space, right? Externally, space to do the kind of work I want to do, where I fit in with all these different interests and passions and areas of expertise. Uh, it's not just a focus on rigid structures and methods. It's it's very fluid. It allows you to be mentally fluid as well. So, and, you know, the inner space to discover myself as a human being and be able to connect with other people. So I resonate really with what Daryl said. There's so much about, you know, learning about what human beings are because empathy is the, the biggest thing here, right? And it's not fake empathy. It's not about user needs. It's about people. Um, so you learn to be more human, and then you realize everything is connected and we, we all are connected in our actions. Everything we do is connected and everything we create is connected and it has repercussions. And so that, you know, brings everything together for me, for futures thinking, or looking at history, you know, human-centered design, life-centered design. So, uh, yeah, it just kind of connects everything for me and gives me a space where I feel comfortable to just be uh, not in a structure. Thank you, Sahara. Federico. Well, it's here from you, sir. I've met a lot of people through design thinking, like you guys, like everyone around here, and, and SS as, as teammates, my teammates in Europe, in everywhere. So I, I really appreciate that. And, and it was like, like life, lifesaver during lockdowns, you know. So that's, and on the other hand, like a more abstract, <laughs> the abstract hand. Yeah. It helped me to have a better understanding of desire. And what I do, I mean, it's like, I almost going to speak again about Kabbalah, but Kabbalah is all about desire, okay? But you start, you know, studying in Aramic, in Hebrew, in, you know, this code, decoding stuff. And sometimes it's very hard to understand desire when you are doing this. And when I start to, to use design thinking for my consultancy and, and everything, I start to have a better understanding of desire because that's everything. That's the root, the seed of everything is desire. So if you are not desired, if things that you are going to do, if people don't desire everything, nothing is going to move. That's like the fuel for everything. So after I, I had this more, you know, uh, we, we call it malchut in Hebrew, but it's like this, this, this part of the, the more grounded understanding of desire that helped me to understand better life and how things are really uh, going on and how you can make people do things and how can you do things go. So that's, that's thing, something that I really found between my two words. That's, that's excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Federico. It makes me also think of, um, uh, I, for a long time, I've been meaning to dive more into the, the world of acting. And there's this thing about like the action and what, what the, what the desire is or something to that effect. If Colin, I think Colin is in the room, he would probably speak to that way more knowledge with way more knowledge and eloquence than I can. 
uh, but I think it, it also speaks to like the the uh, the value to the interdisciplinarity that that Sahara was was highlighting. Just quick impromptu question to the room. Maybe if, if one of you has a, a story to share, have you seen uh, through your work, through your facilitation and the work, have you seen anybody else, somebody else be transformed by design thinking in a, in a, in a significant way in that it changed the, the way that they uh, think about business or their lives or themselves? I think for me, what really helps people connect is storytelling, you know, bringing people's stories out. So it's not just about numbers or data. You've really got to be able to, to convey emotions or what people are experiencing. And I found that storytelling is one way to do that for, you know, to connect a business with what's actually happening on the ground and how they can change and do things. And that kind of resonates with people and, and changes them. Excellent. Thank you so much. So we're going to start to wind down our time together. Uh, like I said at the top of the hour, we hope that this is only the first conversation. And I hope that in addition to conversations, we can do something, uh, uh, get togethers that are interactive, maybe visual, uh, go over to mural or, or have different tools. So if you would all, all of you audience and, and or panelists, if you want to share in the chat, uh, would you like to have more conversations and interactions like this talking about practicing human-centered design or, or this, whatever you want to call this collection of creative problem-solving tools, uh, if you want to get together and I don't know, workshop it or do, do something in some way, uh, let us know in, in the chat uh, if you have any suggested formats that, that you feel would be particularly interesting. And uh, Mimp, I think you also had a question for the audience if you want to pipe up right, right about now. As the poll? Yes. Yes, okay. I'm going to launch a poll asking everybody if you'd like more sessions like this. And launched. Okay, so you should see a poll. Oh, I see people voting, yes. Okay, so it's about... How much more time do we have for the poll? We can do another 30 seconds. If you haven't already, go. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm seeing heavy, heavy preference here for conversational. Surprisingly enough, I thought we might see more interactive uh, inclinations, but they, yeah, the conversation is clearly, clearly doing well. So I'm going to close the polls in five, four, three, two, one. And yes, here's the results. <laughs> so 96% of the people, the, most wow. of the people here want uh, more of these conversations. So, okay. Yeah. Well, okay, we'll make more. You have spoken. <laughs> we have listened. <laughs> we shall make more like this. Uh, great. Dana, yes, uh, we will... Uh, be transitioning to our backstage. So if you can hang up for backstage, you can certainly uh, have free range there to ask questions and interact with our guests. We just wanted to, to open up the space to unpack uh, as many questions as, as we could in the space of an hour. So uh, can we have a round of applause for our guests today? Yay. Woo! Thank you. Thank you very much. And lift um, your mic and clap. Thank you. Yay. All righty. So I'm going to uh, share my screen again. Yes. So we have a few announcements before we transition over to our backstage. So Mimp, I'm gonna throw the ball to you and I'll be advancing the slides. Yes, give me one second. Uh, Howard, I'm just gonna quickly mention that I'll let you ask the questions in the backstage. I'm just gonna wrap this up. Um, so, Yun Yun, can you spotlight me as well, please? I'd love to be the attention. <laughs> Let me find you somewhere. <laughs> there you go. I got you. Thank you. Yes. So um, thank you everybody for coming. Uh, this is, so what you already see on the screen is the next session coming. I will be the speaker alongside with Shihab and Gavin. 
Vipka, would you like to quickly mention something about this session? Because you're organizing it with Nachikit as well. So both of you, feel free to unmute. True, true. And Nachikit's in the room as well, as I, I, if I saw it correctly. Yes, we want to talk about the culture of conflict because we thought that might be quite an intercultural uh, excursion as well. And we're trying to shed light um, onto um, t mentalities, regions of the world that we don't usually feature as much. And I'm really, I, yeah, I would find it really, really interesting to find out what people feel in conflict, how they experience conflict. It's not so much about problem solving, it's, um, it's more about creating an awareness in the first step. So um, be surprised. We've got excellent, excellent and very, <laughs> and very famous speakers like Mim, for example. And I, I have seen Gavin. So um, yeah, I'm really, really looking forward to the session. Thank you so much. And then I'm, yes, yeah, so, and also if you have any uh, ideas about topics that you like to, uh, you know, either be the participant or, or you can also be the speaker, you're very welcome to share in this Google form. I will post the link in the chat right about now. And just a friendly reminder that Wednesday Web Jam is about experimenting. So if you want to prototype something or take a risk and try something out, this is the friendly community and, and the place to do it. So if you have any thoughts about things that you want to experiment with, that's another a lens or approach uh, that you can take with uh, us with your suggestions back to you, Nick. Thank you. Yes, and uh, the next slide, please. Uh, we also, I am aware that we've mentioned this in a lot previously, but we, we currently have a clubhouse. We, at the moment, have about like, 30, 50 people. I don't remember the exact numbers, but if you could go give a follow, that would be great. Uh, I will post the link in the chat also as well. Oh, Donna already has. Thank you so much. Yes. And the next slide. Um, we also are on social medias. Uh, please follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And we also have a LinkedIn community where you can uh, start a conversation there, however, whenever you want to. If you want to continue having a conversation there after this session, feel free to uh, post and start a topic there. Thank you, Donna, for posting the social medias. Uh, you can check in the chat. That is where you can find us. And next slide, please. Uh, this is us. This is the crew members. We, uh, some of us are not here, but some of us are here, like me, Vipka, Jimena, um, Nachiket, uh, Yun Yen, of course, uh, Jenny, et cetera, et cetera. So all these lovely people, and Ezekiel, of course, <laughs> all these lovely people in uh, this uh, slide, uh, we have got together as volunteers. Um, this is, uh, because we are volunteers, everything is free and we want to keep the web jam free but uh, we do encourage if you could uh, help us chip in uh, buy us a coffee we do have some costs to cover such as mailchimp website as well as the zoom premium account where we allow 100 people to be here uh, more than an hour so if you could kindly please uh, you know buy us a coffee thank you and Yes, and you're welcome to hang out with us on the backstage. I believe so, I've said everything. So we're going to say, I think so, we're going to say goodbye to you two. And goodbye to, oh, let me change. Yun Yen, can you change to gallery view? Changing the gallery view too. Yeah. So we can see everybody before we say goodbye to YouTube. <laughs> okay. Goodbye, YouTube. Bye-bye, YouTube. Bye-bye.